Now, while Tito Mbuweni might have appeased rating agencies somewhat with promises to cut the ballooning public sector wage bill, the move could usher in a massive labor unrest as labor federations across the political divide slammed Mbuweni's decision, saying it amounts to a full frontal attack on their members and those who live of the wages of these workers. To respond to uh, the gauntlet that has been thrown down by Labour, I'm now joined in the studio by the Deputy Finance Minister, Dr. David Masondo. Uh, Deputy Minister, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's get straight to it. So, Andre Krill uh, from uh, the uh, Union Kusa, uh, um, Saktu uh, said on my Facebook page this morning, um, you know, what exactly... Uh, when exactly will the public procurement bill be published? Why launch an attack on public sector workers' current collective bargaining rights? Um, hence, the, the whole collective bargaining structure of both public and private sector workers, instead of not just simply waiting to table it during the next round of negotiations. Why are you jumping the gun? Uh, good uh, morning, Karim, and to your viewers. Uh, first, the public procurement bill, we've published it already. We're expecting the public to give us their comments on what they think uh, we should do procurement better in order to improve efficiencies and spend our money better. Now, insofar as the uh, public uh, wage bill, I think we need to put everything in context. Firstly, as government, we're saying that uh, the cost of uh, doing, of providing public service is increasingly getting higher and unaffordable. Yes. Um, and what are the things that are driving our ability are making it difficult for us to provide public service on a continuous basis. Of course, it's the wage bill, the debt service cost. In the next three years, the debt service cost, the interest payment that we pay on our public debt is going to be $778 billion. The wage bill is one of the cost drivers uh, for our ability to run the public service. So what we've said, we've, we've been making a lot of proposals informally with the labor movement. And a day before we table the budget, we went back to labor and said, look, yes. the last leg of the wage, the three-year agreement, it's not going to be affordable mm. for government. So let's have a conversation on that. Now, let's just quickly take a listen to the reaction to that proposal that you put on the table the day before budget, um, post the budget from the Kusatu uh, um, uh, tra Federation uh, President uh, Zingi Swalo. So let's have a listen to what she had to say. The agreement is very clear that if any party wants to review, it has to be in agreement and in writing. So it was irresponsible of the minister to even make mention of a process that he's not part of. Because he's not part of the PSCPC processes. There's a minister assigned to that. And you can't undermine that process. Now, the Kusatu president emphatic there. The Kusatu president emphatic about the fact that there is an agreement in place. The finance minister has no business talking about this. Um, you were in those negotiations uh, the night before. Um, how are you going to get out of a legally binding agreement? Firstly, it is true that uh, uh, Minister Mkunu is leading the negotiations on wage negotiations. So we support as Treasury, and as you correctly say, a night before uh, of those uh, negotiations, we've had some kind of discussions within government. So there's nothing wrong, Karima, in looking at an agreement and going back to the parties in that agreement and say, we think certain aspects of this agreement were not imposing, let's renegotiate certain aspects of the agreement. So I think that was the spirit of the uh, action that government took the day before, and that was led by Minister um, Cohn. And of course, we have to communicate collectively as government. So there are instances where the Minister of Finance will have to speak on certain aspects which are not necessarily directly related to his... Uh, but these wage negotiations, the president of Kosovo, which is correct, is led by 
the uh, Minister of Public Service. Now that we've got the line function out of the way, let's get to the substance of the actual agreement. It's a three-year agreement, right? Um, I'm going to ask my producers to put the, uh, the copy of the agreement up, but I've got it in front of me here, Minister, and of course it is um, very clear uh, when these um, uh, uh, agreements actually kick in. So what is going to happen on the 1st of April coming? If you and the trade unions don't come to an agreement on whether the, um, the second and third year of that wage agreements come into existence? I think uh, we will have to keep negotiating. Um, and, and if we don't uh, agree, uh, we, there's a second round of negotiating the three-year uh, wage agreement for the uh, next three years. Because the, we, what we're talking about now is the last year, yeah. and we will try our best to go back to the trade union movement through Minister Mkunu to table our views on what we think should be done in so far as this wage um, uh, bill crisis that we have in the country. And uh, if we don't agree, we'll have to look at what are the things that we need to do uh, in so far as the three cycle of the wage negotiations, which is going to start soon. Uh, Minister, uh, Deputy Minister, one of the things that people have been saying is that instead of making it harder for workers, why are you even considering reducing corporate tax rates when uh, people uh, like the trade unions are claiming that business is in fact on an investment strike? So the tax relief is not just for um, the, 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 the corporate, but it's also for workers. So the, our view is that uh, it's important to leave some money in the hands of the consumers as well as investors so that they can invest this money into the economy. There's a limit, Karima, to, which, to the extent to which you can tax people. You can tax people to the extent where they don't find it rational to invest in the economy. So there are instances in your tax policy, like in this instance, where you have to say there's a limit to which we can continuously tax people. I think the other way of stimulating the economy is to leave money in the hands of the business as well as uh, workers in order for them to invest. Now look, all these measures that you've taken is of course to try and deal with uh, the debt that we have. Uh, we're sitting at a, an alarming uh, situation, almost 70% to GDP. Uh, besides cutting the public sector wage bill, what other measures are you taking to get that debt under control? You, you're right. I mean, our debt now is 3.5 trillion, and uh, it's projected to grow to 4 trillion. And if we don't do anything, and that's in percentage terms, we're going to 70 percent. 70 percent, and we pay interest on that uh, debt, uh, 256 billion, just to service the debt. And then, like I said, if we don't do anything, the next three years we'll be spending 778 billion just to pay uh, the interest on this debt. So one way of dealing with this debt is to grow the economy. Because if you grow the economy, you're laying the good conditions, material conditions for us to generate more tax. But and how, therefore we need how, to... How do you grow the economy if people have less cash in their hands? Because that is essentially what you need. You need people with disposable cash uh, to be able to buy goods. If you are going to, for example, make it harder for a nurse or the, a police officer to have cash in their hands to buy goods, how do you plan on stimulating the economy? Firstly, we've given tax relief to the uh, middle class, including teachers. But secondly, monetary, I mean, fiscal policy, uh, taxation and all that, they're important. But we've got to deal with the structural constraints in our economy, the supply of electricity. I mean, you were talking about Transnet. It's important for us to make sure that Transnet is uh, efficient in transporting goods. Prasa is efficient in transporting people in order for us to make the cost of doing business. Let me ask Africa you a better. direct question here. Should those who owe electricity, like the Soweto residents who've been protesting, saying they want to play a flat, flat rate, should they pay uh, what they owe ESCOM? They should, but you remember government has an indigent policy. Those who cannot I'm not talking about the indigent. No, those, who ones, those who must pay, who can yeah. afford to pay. Why are you not making them pay? No, they have to pay. I mean, I've, I've been doing road shows going throughout the country, at Teguini, uh, Pulukwa, and Limpopo, 
And all what I've been saying to municipalities is that if people do not pay their services, you have to switch off the electricity, particularly for those ones who can afford to pay, because we cannot continue to provide freebies to people who can afford to pay. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that people are often talking about when they say you can recoup monies uh, without having to make workers bear the brunt for inefficient government is to deal with wastage, which accounts for something like 10% of the budget, if I have my figures correctly. Spell out what you are doing about wastage and to recoup the monies uh, that we lose through wastage. I mean, there are investigations going on in certain instances. I mean, for instance, the ESCOM, uh, we, um, I think it's McKenzie, in which government was able to recoup some money from them. During the state capture uh, process, it's, uh, this uh, McBain, which was involved in enabling state capture of SARS, they have paid some money. To some companies, such as Deloitte, they had to pay some of the money that were basically um, had to be recouped from government, and government has been successful in so far as getting some of these monies back. Uh, Deputy Minister, let me put you on the spot as a last question. You sit on the NEC of the ANC, you sit on the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party. Uh, they slammed this budget saying that you are uh, making the poor pay and that you could have cut elsewhere, you could have, uh, for example, um, taxed uh, uh, rich people a little bit more. Um, how do you walk that delicate egg down so that uh, workers are able to understand that everybody, not just them, have to take the pain. Um, how do you make people put their sectional interests one side and act in the national interest? We're paying a lot of money in bailing out SOEs and it's important for us to begin to look at the SOEs in order to take some are of the money. Are you suggesting a different, a different funding um, model? There the, the are different funding models that are being put in place, including business models, for instance, for SAA. There's no airline. Did you say that amounts to, to privatization, does it? It does not necessarily amount to privatization. If you look at SAA, its business model is outdated. Many of the airlines, they don't make a lot of money from the aircraft. They've got integrated services. Uh, if you book a flight, they integrate it to hotel, uh, cars, and, and, and a lot of... It's a package, and therefore... Internally, when one business unit loses money, it gets subsidized by other business units within the same uh, company. So some of the SOEs, they really have to change their business models. Otherwise, we'll keep on bailing them out and thus shifting money from the poor to bail them out consistent. Are you ready for a public sector strike? The state is the largest employer. Are we going to get there? It's not our desired outcome. We'll do our best to um, negotiate with the labor movement and make sure that we find each other. Uh, but um, if the strike comes, we'll have to deal with it. All right. Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. David Masondo, thank you so very much for joining us. Up next, we take a look at the stories making headlines in the weekend newspapers. Stay tuned.